Um, and I do want to, I think there's like two big things I at least want to start with before I just kind of open it up beyond myself as well um, for Christian and Tony. One of the things that we were asked about, and I think I shared it with these you guys, was in terms of just resources that might be useful for keeping tabs on what's happening with, uh, with liquor, with national and state liquor laws, as people who have to stay up to date on these kinds of things. And I'll extend this beyond just to maybe just laws within your purview in general. Where is it that you typically turn to in terms of just trying to keep up with what's going on? Well, the one thing I recommend, and it's what we do at the Regulated Pod Twitter account as well, is really the national associations are a great resource. And, and one of the great things, I'll let Christian maybe talk more about the cannabis side. I'll, I'll, but um, one of the great things about the cannabis space is, as a general matter is that everybody's trying to get a foothold, right? There's so many emerges, emerging jurisdictions and different emerging topics. So um, the, you know, like the National Cannabis Industry Association, but even on the stuff that kind of it, it has its foot in both places, alcohol and cannabis, you know, the uh, Distilled Spirits Council has uh, produced some resources on this. Um, any of the beer associations, of course, they've, they've all got, you know, explainers on it that can be good resources. And, but, but, you know, speaking of the foothold, you know, attorneys like myself have been publishing content, not necessarily me, because uh, I'm more focused on the alcoholic beverage side. But um, there are a number of sort of national cannabis law firms um, or regional cannabis law firms that spend a lot of time uh, on this issue. So I'd encourage you to, to reach out to some of them on Twitter, LinkedIn. I mean, they're just content creating machines and they provide a lot of good resources and a lot of stuff. Again, the regulated pod account, we retweet a bunch of those national associations and law firms as well. Okay. I mean, myself. Um, so we use, um, we use a service called uh, BDO and uh, we get uh, bas basically it's a, it's a constant flow of information about rules and statutes updates specifically as for like news and, and, and kind of what's happening. Twitter is like both the best and the worst thing that I use in the sense that uh, it, it, there's a constant like flashing red light when things are happening, but Breaking. uh <laughs> right, right. But so like I do, I do mostly like government affairs type of stuff and, and compliance. And so unfortunately, uh, the way people tweet and, and uh, you know, for I, I know this is kind of geared for the press corps too. the way sometimes the press writes about bills that are introduced, it, it like really will psych you up because like, oh, man, there's a bill that's introduced in Texas to uh, to, you know, modify the medical marijuana program. That's that's amazing. It was introduced by, you know, two, two Democrat representatives. It's not even going to get heard in committee. It's, you know, DOA. So um, it's, it, it kind of jerks your chain around a lot. But I, I honestly don't know how you would kind of exist in 2021 trying to keep your finger on the pulse without using Twitter. Um, uh, Marijuana Moment is very good. I follow a, a couple of financial guys, uh, Jason Spadafor, Spadafora, who's also AKA Wolf of Weed Street on Twitter. He's awesome. Alan Brockstein, the investor for 420 is um, awesome. There's also a guy, I, th I think his name is Todd McPherson, um, who if you give this guy, seriously, I'll, I'll find him later, but um, there, there's one guy on LinkedIn. He, he used to work for Bacardi and his last name is McPherson. And I, 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 it's Tom or Todd. And it's literally the funniest, most insightful shit you will ever see about the cannabis industry. I mean, this is guy goes back with CPG for like decades. And he's just like, he praises the people who deserve to be praised and just lights up with such insightful commentary. The people who are kind of a little bit on the scandalous side or a little bit, a little bit shady, just awesome. Oh, another good resource too, and, and these are put people in the journalism world, um, the Boston Globe. I mean, as you guys probably know, uh, newspapers have been rolling out sort of cannabis verticals over the past several years. Um, the Denver newspaper was obviously, I think, probably the first to do it. Um, so they, they've had a rotating group of journalists that have come through there. They're, they're great resources. But the one that I really like now, and they're newer maybe in the last, you know, the pandemic makes time a little elastic, but in the last 18 months or so they rolled out was the Boston Globe. They have an incredible resource and they, they have been spinning up a lot of content that's pretty good and kind of really on point. But to Christian's point, I mean, it is really difficult to tell with the context what some of these passages or hearings means. 
mean, right? You know, um, like the Safe Baking Act, for instance, if you were to follow Twitter over the past 18 months, you would think every four days that it was about to pass. You know, this chairman said this, this senator said this, this Democrat, this Republican said that, and it's, it still hasn't passed, right? <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of people who think it has passed. Like there's, right, that, right. that's kind of a disservice that, you know, you, you get the clickbait article. It's like, oh, this is, you know, it just passed the house or the like state X's legislature just passed. And it's like, okay, the house passed it and it's controlled by one party. The, the Senate is controlled by the other and has publicly stated for two months that it's not going anywhere. And it, it but, but you'll still have a, an, an, a significant portion of people who just see that headline on like Twitter or co go, pop across their Google feed and they think that like, oh man, North Carolina has a medical marijuana program now, you know? Yeah, well, I, I actually, bro, can you hear me, Brian? Can I jump in for a question? Yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, my mic was off. I was trying to show off my smooge that I had my knockoff smooge. Um, anyway, so you, you mentioned that these, these uh, big dailies are, are launching verticals. Do you predict that there will be like, a cottage industry of marijuana journalism as things become more deregulated because I think you know even in the last 10 years beer journalism has changed a lot to the point where you get very dedicated very specific coverage and do you anticipate that will happen in the cannabis space too? Um, I yeah I mean it, it kind of already has so there there are definitely sites I said like the one I cited was marijuana moment which is basically a uh, a journalist journalistic project that just focuses on nothing but marijuana. Um, you know, and you have you, you have podcasts that have popped up. You have people who are writing, and it, it's very uh, you know, MJ Biz Daily is uh, mm -hmm. is is a huge. I, I, I'm I'm, made, I'm sorry for not mentioning that earlier. That's a huge um, important website. Um, but I'll, I'll say this: so, like, if you go on Twitter and you look at the real like thought leaders in in cannabis who are writing about it or like speaking about it, like they, their their socials, maybe their impressions are good on their posts, but actual like followers on their accounts, it's it's not very robust. It's it's, it's still, I think, as far as like influencers, still a bit of a cottage industry, unless you're getting into like the celeb world and you're talking about like burner with or or like um you know jay-z or or the, these huge celebrities that have, have gotten into cannabis industry what do you think tony no i agree you know i think the beer world is probably a good model but you know i work in the casino industry as well and there you know that's obviously an even more developed industry right um than, than cannabis and you know as far as dedicated casino the publications you know you have ggb which is global gaming business um and then you know, you have a couple a couple websites that do it. The Pollock Report really focuses on horse racing, but I, I don't get the sense that you know there's no Sports Illustrated. Well, to, to flash back to the 1990s, right? There's no, it, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It is definitely. <laughs> I am laughing at the chat chat right now, and I think we um you know I won't say this idea, but there's a very good idea for a business. So I'll leave it to to Brian and Kate to to spin that one out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I just wonder, <laughs> that, I that is so great. The, <laughs> well, done, my impression Jared. of the coverage is that it is right. so much about you know like the regulatory process, you know, these movements right. in local legislatures, and then also about you know, like it's very focused on the legality and, and like the business side, like building a business, but not much of it, at least from what I've seen, is about like the product and the experience. And well, I, here's, do you think it will mature into that? Here, here's the problem: the segmentation and and. and because there's no federal legalization, like in Florida, for instance, everything's vertically integrated. So if you have a mar medical marijuana treatment center license, you have to grow it, you have to distribute it, and you have to sell it, right? So if you have a, let's say, a popular strain like Bronx, which is a very popular strain, I think it was the strain of the year last year. If you were to sample that at the Jacksonville Beach location of any particular dispensary or at the Boynton Beach location of any particular dis dispensary and then go out to Colorado, maybe that, maybe that product has the same lineage, right? but it's not grown the same place. It doesn't taste the same. Your experience may vary. It might be 15% THC here, 25% there. It's not the same product. But if Brian writes a, an, an article about a beer or mentions a beer on his Twitter, I can go to the Publix and, and have that exact same experience. And I might send him a DM. You know, this was a great recommendation, something along those lines. So I think that segmentation is, you know, it's almost irrelevant. If a buddy of mine called from Chicago and was like, oh, I tried this great strain, it's really cool. 
it's me it's basically meaningless to a user in florida or meaningless to a user in in in, uh, in california um because the the, the product is very so much because of the regulatory structure so so maybe it does hinge i mean I, christian i don't know what you think about this maybe yeah. do you think it hinges on the federal piece well i mean kind of so like i would say i mean like you know, when you think of like cannabis media, like the OG is High Times, right? And that was a cult counterculture periodical. And like that was doing it for decades before it became legal, right? Uh, now there, there has been this need as, as far as a cottage industry to inform all of the just tens of thousands of people that are looking to career switch or young people who don't have a career yet who are looking to get involved in cannabis this this you you just almost never see this this type of uh it's you know it's not tech it's not crypto it's actually like growing things manufacturing things brick and mortar retail and this thing just appeared out of nowhere right so there's this huge um demand for uh on the minute updates on the regulatory structure, because right now regulatory is one of the most important moving pieces of, of cannabis. Obviously the product distribution, all that is very important, but like you ultimately got to get these licenses um, and, and be compliant and go through all those hoops before you can make money. Um, but I mean, I, I think the cannabis media uh, was like has has arisen with with some really interesting things just kind of rippling through media um, all at the same time right so a lot of media is is now moved on to socials like a lot of reporters like that's where they drive a lot of their traffic from is is sharing their stories socials are not friendly for cannabis Instagram is is tough Facebook is tough uh, Twitter you can get away with a little bit more but um, uh, I, I, but I, I will tell you, like, go on YouTube and you can look for like these connoisseur guys or gals that will just get on and talk shop about weed while they're smoking weed um, and and go real in depth. So like podcasts are rising, YouTube is rising, the socials when they can kind of, you know, sk sk skirt past the censors is, is rising. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think it's only going to grow. So what you're what you're talking about is something that is present but like it will it will everything that the connoisseurs are doing in alcohol right now i think it will mirror in in canvas because there are people who are just as passionate about it well and, and christian's point about social media is really important mm -hmm. and I, I have a regulated example we had uh, i don't remember which <laughs> well, <I'll tell> <laughs> we had a um a bombshell episode i think it was about florida's edibles industry where we did sort of a, a really intense breakdown of what the new regulations meant. And it was good, it was doing great numbers. And I thought this is an opportunity for us to promote because there's a lot of people that are gonna be very interested in this product base. It, was a, it seemed like a huge opportunity for MMTCs and it seemed like there's gonna be a ready base, a ready set sort of customer base for it. So I went on Facebook and tried to buy some ads. I was like, I'll throw 20 bucks on this to see if maybe we can double our, our, our listenership for this episode. And I got shut down because even though we weren't, you know, we weren't, you know, promoting anything or, you know, in terms of, usage I mean, it was a very um you know we were discussing sort of the industry side of it right but because it said cannabis and it said edibles it, it fell through the filter and, and i think christian's point about high times is really interesting because when you look at sort of what we uh you know i'm in my late 30s so you think of stoner culture growing up you know it was like cheech and chong and dashikis and 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 vw beetles and stuff like that and, you know, to contrast to what it was today, I got a call or actually a text from a, a big law firm lawyer. Um, uh, I won't give too much identifying information, but a very big law firm lawyer who was texting me about um, his or her medical marijuana car and a product that he, that he had tried um, here in Florida. I think because I, I happen to host a, a podcast that does a lot of cannabis content. Um, all of my friends think I'm the cannabis expert. So whenever they have an experience like that, you know, my sort of nerdy lawyer, lawyer colleagues and friends, they, they want to text me and I'm like, basically, you know, cool story, bro. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, that's the difference. You know, you think of sort of the, the, the kids in high school um, who are quote unquote stoners and quote unquote stoner culture. And you think about the way the market has expanded and matured, um, especially because it came through from the medical component. You know, you know, even in my conversation on text today, we talked about arthritis, right? We talked about we talked about CBD products. We had sort of a wide ranging discussion about it. 
So I think it's totally different. And I don't know what that means for the way that the media is sort of going to sort of develop. And maybe what that means is that it's very segmented. You know, maybe you have some of that you sort of, you know, maybe the moms read magazine or blog, you know, sort of like just like YouTube, right? You have the one for more like club kids. Maybe it's very segmented, just like everything else. People are ch- going to be chasing the long tail of the SEO, the search engine optimization. That's, that's, and that, you know, honestly, that's probably where everything is going. If you look at Apple iTunes and look at, you know, uh, Google Podcasts, everybody's sort of niching further and further down, trying to find some sort of audience somewhere to, to run those streams. I want to maybe like tie those two things together a little bit too, because in my experience, uh, I'm just kind of like uh, a drop-in reporter randomly ad hoc when it comes to cannabis, because I try to stay aware of what's going on and I'll work on a couple stories about it, maybe, you know, over the course of a year. And what I find uh, in Christian, I think you hit it really well the there is a collect there are a collection of publications who go so deep and offer so much i get overwhelmed with the amount of like even data i can find to help paint a picture for a more layman audience but then on the other side of that there's kind of like uh general lifestyle stories that may appear in larger publications or like the, I know for like Denver, the Denver Post, for example, like they do legitimate coverage because of the way that the industry functions there. But I guess what I'm getting at is that the middle ground between those two things seems awfully squishy. And like, there's not a lot going on there to bridge that gap between the in-depth niche reporting that like you guys talk about and these publications that you're talking about versus national Uh, coverage in magazine or newspapers, which has to play it at a higher level because of the audience. And so I don't, I like, I literally don't know what might exist in that middle area. And Christian, it also sounds a little bit like, and Tony, like you were mentioning the segmented nature of this because of state to state and the different kinds of experiences. It's not clear to me if that middle ground is an easy place to fill right now in terms of media coverage and sharing those stories. Well, one it's, thing I think about, oh, go ahead, Christian. No, go ahead, please. So, well, this is kind of a, a side note, but, you know, one thing I think about, Brian, is, and maybe I'm an alien, but, you know, one of the most popular um, things for people to do is to watch cooking shows right now, right? Um, and, you know, is there a concept that's like, and, and I think I think perhaps uh, Vice has, uh, yeah, has Vice done has a, a show, show with THC cooking where they, they use the, the, you know, they, and it, the food looks great, but maybe I'm an alien. Like, I don't care what other people eat and I don't care to look at food, right? I care to, 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 to eat, I care to eat food, right? I don't care about somebody's, somebody's, um, the beer that they had in Denver when they were on a trip. If I wanted to drink a beer, I would get my own beer, you know? So I, I don't know, I, I presume that same model though would be effective because it's obviously something that most people enjoy. Maybe, I, and it'd be interesting to look to see what the ratings are on that, that Vice show relative to the rest of their lineup, whether it's something sort of that cooking sort of um, experiential sort of uh, model, maybe that's something that brings the hook in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it probably still goes back to what we were talking about. It probably ends up being very focused on, um, you know, this is for hipsters. Um, this is for 47 year old dads in the Northeast, you know, <laughs> very sort of niche down. I, I think that, to, to be honest, I don't think there, so this is just my opinion. My opinion is I'm, I'm not certain that there is uh, much room in that kind of middle general consumer, unless it's, a, unless it's a very significant story, like the proposition of federal legalization, which is kind of like Lucy in the football. Like almost, even that seems like it's petering out a little bit because people are getting kind of tired of reading about how the federal government's about to legalize and then two, three months pass and nothing happened. Um, I mean, we read about New York doing it for three years and it became a big deal when we did it. But again, it was it was the same type of deal. So <clears throat> when a state first legalizes or is in the run up to legalization, right? There's a lot of interest because there's there cannabis is sexy and it's simple and it's a little scary. So when you're going uh, launching in a new state, 
you have all of these people who are like, oh my gosh, it's finally happening. It's finally coming here. What's going to happen? Like, who are the players? How is this going to shake out? Um, and then, you know, you, the, the, the press tip, like Florida's, a, I'll use Florida's example. The press went through this like sugar rush from like 2014 to like 2018, where, you know, everything was like, was weed or, you know, pot. And, it, you know, that I was a regulator. Everybody called me the weeds are like in, in like actual real like reporters would write this stuff. And it was like, you could tell they were writing it because they were trying to kind of be hip and, and fresh and like with the times of this kind of exciting story because they got clicks. But it, it, when you see a state start, its market starts to mature, the reality of the cannabis is that cannabis is just like any other industry when you actually get down to the nuts and bolts of, of like running the, 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 the actual business and the legal side is other than like these really weird wrinkles like federal prohibition and the lack of bank. I mean, obviously there are, there are distinct distinctions there, but you kind of get five or six years into the great experiment and people are like, they've, they kind of read that story before. Right. So, um, I think it's going to ultimately, you're going to have the trades, right? The trades who are writing about the super niche, like wonky stuff that's happening. You're going to have the cultural stuff, which I think will ultimately be where a lot of the meat is going to be on the bones about like the actual cross section of entertainment and cannabis and, you know, consumer taste. Tony brought up a great point of, you know, right now, unlike alcohol where you can bottle it and you can ship it in every market and it's going to taste exactly the same. Like, cannabis because of the licensing structure you can't ship across state lines like there's a lot of not just the interest but like a compelling need for people who are consuming that product and have taste preferences and are taste makers to share their opinions with people um, who aren't nearly as experienced as they are and like are looking for someone to guide them among the thousands of, of skews that they're going to be exposed to in their market. Well, and there, there was a funny dynamic in Florida. I don't know if I've ever told you this, Christian, but <laughs> there was a funny dynamic in Florida where, so it, it, by coincidence, Christian and I hadn't met yet, but when he was the head marijuana uh, uh, regulator, I was across town just a few miles away as the top uh, casino regulator in the state of Florida. Um, and I would be sitting in my office and turn on the Florida channel, which is basically like PBS or C-SPAN for Florida. And I would see his face and he all the time rulemaking he was on television getting lit up by the, the legislature night. getting getting <laughs> uh, on the stand and getting sued just i was always on the florida channel <laughs> he was, he and it was, was never good years. it was never a good experience when there were cameras filming me when i was in that role <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting in my office i'm approving like new casino permits and which never happened i couldn't get my name in the paper to save my life <laughs> So there definitely was a big sugar sugar rush in media, and, and rightfully so, because I, you know I was in an old industry, and medical marijuana was a really big deal in states that it comes into. It, it, it just is a bigger deal than adding a twenty fifth permit or whatever. You know? Yeah, I want to connect some dots again because what when when we talk about uh, going from potential coverage and storytelling and uh, the limits in terms of either the kinds of publications in which those stories can live or the stories themselves. So there's like all these moving pieces of what might lead. And I, I, I think Christian, Tony, I'm gonna ask you if there's any credence to what in my head I'm starting to form. If I'm trying to pitch stories about cannabis uh, as it relates to culture or legislation, I should be looking at states that have uh, budget deficits, maybe have had conversations about some form of legalization in the past, and then start identifying publications in that state because the interest in storytelling would exist quite literally within those borders. Do those three things ring true in any way? Sure. I mean, yeah, I, I think like I think about like my mom and dad when I think about like general interest. They don't care about they they they're not like high level cannabis consumers. Like they're not involved really culturally, and they're not they're not wonks. And all, all three of those facets are something that like if it's a good story, and there there are because it's 
there's a lot of money involved, a lot of interest, a lot of moving pieces. There, there are good stories, and all three of those things that you pointed out are, um, are excellent. Um, I mean, like Tony, Tony and I, on our pod, like every other episode is about weed because we just find new kind of interesting, generally appealing stuff to to happen. And like, the thing is, is that there are stuff, there is stuff that's wonky that I think has public it's like an interesting public story. So, so like, um, <clears throat> for example, like one, uh, Tony and I did a whole pod about edibles, which he, he mentioned. And one of the things we were talking about was like, I, 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 we talked for like 20 minutes about how boring Florida's edibles rules are and how they were the regulatory equivalent of uh, when Dwight and Jim threw Kelly Kapoor a birthday and it was all brown half inflated balloons and it was just a sign in the back that said it is your birthday period unlike that old like 1980 printer paper that's what that's what Florida's edibles were like it's it's white opaque containers you can't have any kind of imagery or colors or you can't even see the flower through the packaging it's like literally the state made it as boring as it could possibly be and so like com a the compare and contrast contrast and then also like why why like why are they doing that what are the underlying motivations of, and like what is the legislature trying to signal about the industry about themselves about the constituents by doing stuff like that um so i i think i think there there is so much turf to cover as as a as, as someone like you who's like generally interested in trying to find stuff that's that can be appealing to non-wonky readers and I am, you know, of course, I am biased here. I'm a regulatory attorney. Um, I've lobbied in the past at the legislature and other bodies, right? So maybe it's just my nerdy instincts here. But I think the why is really interesting because in my line of work, especially in the casino, you know, I work in old school industries, right? Casinos and, and alcoholic beverages. We're talking about 1930s and 40s legislation that's just been updated and updated and updated. And the running joke in my business is that if you look at a statute, and there's something funky, maybe that gives rights to a certain class of individuals, not to mention distributors here, but rights to a certain class of individuals. And the question is always, well, why? Why is this reserved for them? Why do they? Why does this class have this this uh, bunch of permissions and this group does not? Why are they shut out? There's actually a, a, a big discussion here in Florida this week about the cocktails to go legislation that was just signed by the government. And, and one of the things with this legislation is that it's reserved to a certain class of restaurants that essentially has to be over 2,500 square feet. And the attack, I, I think, uh, the attack was that, you know, that's basically large chain, you know, large, rich restaurants, and you're shutting out mom and pop. That, that's the attack. I'm not saying I agree with that or not. But that's just what the, the article was that came out. And one of the jokes in, in my business is when you ask why, what's the public policy rationale, the response is often, well, who had the better lobbyists, you know? So it, it might be, <laughs> there's actually a better answer than that, you know, but it might be an interesting story to see. Um, you know, there's an article today and I won't mention the, um, I won't mention the, uh, the outlet, but let's say that it's a probably a top, I'll just say top 10, probably top five publication in the country that wrote about uh, casino laws and casino licenses in the state of Florida. And they, they essentially got the entire article wrong. I love that tweet. I loved your tea. <laughs> you just openly mocked them. <laughs> I, 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 a now deleted tweet. <laughs> I said, you know, oh hey, maybe God. it's not a great idea for me to poke fun at the, you know, the uh, top five newspaper in the country. <laughs> I, was I was baffled by the, was the article. So you should do that more often. It was so funny. So I, I think digging into the why and then leaning on local resources and getting their perspectives. Um, is important because not everything is what it seems. Sometimes the answer really is they just had a better lobbyist. Um, and sometimes it's something else. But even that answer is important. You know, even if the, the public policy rationale is thin, that in, of, in and of itself is a story. So, you know, maybe that's a perspective. Um, Kate, uh, you might not have names to name, but you did have a question. Um, what were you curious to ask about? Yeah, I think um, maybe we were talking about distributors and regulatory structure and that teased this up perfectly. So the National Beer Wholesalers Association just had their legislative conference, which I'm sure we all watched with rapt attention. Um, but looking over some of their priorities from that conference, one of them 
uh, was marijuana policy, CBD policy. And the NBWA's position is that the structure, the three-tier structure of alcohol regulation is a very good one for cannabis. Perfect, look, we already know how to do it. Why don't we just apply it? So I'm trying to read between the lines and think of why are they pushing this? And my question is, is it because dis beer distributors want to be cannabis distributors? Like what, why are they so interested in having, like, why are they so interested in pushing this same? Can, can I, can I say, I'm going to say something to Tony. I don't think any of you guys technically can, cause you're all in the industry, but I don't care what the beer industry thinks about me because it's a racket. <laughs> It's, it's somebody yeah. who makes tens or millions and millions of dollars for taking something from here and giving it over here. Like it's, oh, I mean, I'm sure so you had a distributor. Marketing I'm, value and cold chain. <laughs> and we, we all agree with this. Of this course, course they I'm want to be. To say I'm, I was about to say it because yeah. my, the, okay. way I set up my, the way I set up my law practice, part of this is for personal philosophical reasons, but part of this is because of the reality. There's more vendors and there's more manufacturers and there are distributors. And candidly, look, I'm a 37 year old black man in the South and all these distributors hire the attorney that golfs with the judge and the mayor. So I'm, I'm honestly not that worried about them. And unfortunately, somebody's gonna play this tape to the distributors at some point, but <laughs> I'm not really that concerned about- losing Prove, them, prove them wrong distributors, prove yeah, them wrong. Yeah, yeah, prove, hire prove Tony. Wrong. I would be a great advocate for give you. Him a, give um, him a conflict so he can't talk shit on, uh, on YouTube anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lawyer for pay, not for love, you know? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like, of course, of course, they want to do a three tier system in cannabis, like, of, of, of like, it's millions and millions and millions, I mean, billions of dollars, right? And you, you, the, the opportunity to penetrate that system that's doing perfectly fine without them, and like, insert themselves, create this, like, business bureaucracy in the between cultivation and dispensing. Um, but I feel like beer distributors are not super like adaptable. Like they kind of do their thing that they've been doing and mm -hmm. cannabis would be like a whole different space for them. But I guess if there are enough dollar signs, you're saying they would be interested in that. All, all the beer distributors need to be successful in the cannabis space um, are probably two things. One, a statute that requires their involvement. And then as a part of that statute, a come to rest requirement, which we have in Florida which is essentially the idea that they take control of the cannabis product and then take it to their warehouse. And then that product has to come to rest in their warehouse. Would mean, it mean that you have to sit it on the ground and have it sit there for, for a one Mississippi count and then put it back into a truck and take it someplace else. I call it the regulatory, you know, and, 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 and I used to play, I played one year of JV basketball right in high school. And um, I, was a, I was a mediocre player, sort of a, if you could imagine a Dennis Rodman, but but that couldn't rebound. <laughs> and, the H worm. Not sure. And so, so I, ran, I ran a lot of suicides yeah. in practice. <laughs> and that's what this is. This is running end to end for no reason <laughs> after school. And they just want to run end to end from, from the, the supplier to their warehouse to the retailer and then collect their vague off the, you know, collect the skim the cream off the top. Now, it's an incredible I, opportunity. I will say the industry is going to have to fight them off on this because I think that 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 a they're going to want money right but b there's there's some things happening in the industry right now that it's kind of it's setting the pins up for them to be able to uh to take advantage um of the situation so like you have some states are are paving that way because it's it, and it's an unintended consequences of another policy the decision they make so some some of these states in an effort to like promote local businesses, um, they, they they want they're trying to figure out regulatory and statutory ways to keep multi-state operators, big like large publicly traded uh, companies, from coming in, and and at least not getting that initial license. Maybe they can buy it from somebody who wins it, right? And so one of the ways they do that is by having disaggregated licenses, like ban outright banning vertical supply chains. And um, when you do that, now you are effectively create, you know, you have a disaggregated supply chain. And so now there's a chunk in the middle that someone could argue, like, let's just streamline that chunk in the middle. The second is, uh, is testing. And, and so testing and seed to sale tracking are, are two components that you will find in every regulated market in the country. 
and um, like devil's advocate that like a some type of supply like regulated middleman is that that's what they're they're arguing that like that that middleman is is the best place in the supply chain to test for uh, not not just for potency to make sure it matches the label but also like adulterants or mold you know stuff like that that can be in the products uh, so so they're coming like that's not going anywhere they you know they have the the they have extremely they're probably more powerful lobby in dc than um or any, at the state level than a lot of cannabis companies do. And look, and that's, that's not to say that a distribution uh, distribution tier can't make sense from a business standpoint. I think what's important um, is that, you know, they should be prepared to compete for that, to show their value. Um, you know, I kind of, um, and, and, you know, I'm not like a Cato Institute guy or anything like that, right? But I, in, in this respect, I do think the free market matters, right? Because I kind of bristle a little bit against all ver mandated vertical integration, and I bristle against against uh, against uh, mandatory non-integration. I think if there's a model, if there's somebody can make a business case for coming in and providing that tier of service, I think they should be able to do so, provided that they meet the state regulations as far as getting a license to do so. Right. So I, I'd like I'd love to see a hybrid model um, where people are allowed to participate at different levels, um, but. You know, I'd love to see that in alcohol as well. And that's not something that's forthcoming anytime soon, at least not in my state. So to follow that up, I just, you know, it's great that you see that the distributor tier sort of embracing the business model, but on the same time, the other two tiers have had like pretty vocal opposition in a lot of legislatures to um, the cannabis industry. And they see it naturally as a competitor um, because no one has ever smoked weed and also drank. Uh, but <laughs> how do you how do you get to the point where you have you know the manufacturers and the wholesalers accepting this you know complementary or supplementary product into like the intoxication space or whatever you want to call it? Who who is doing the accepting in that question? Like who do? Well, I mean, yeah, the 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 liquor manufacturers and wholesalers. I, well, I mean. I don't know. I mean, what the simple answer is a lot of those guys are investing in cannabis right now. So it's, they're essentially sister companies. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. So like, is that all it takes is like to see the potential of making money off it? I'll, I'll tell you what though. You yeah. That, I mean, there's that, but there's also like, um, there is, there is a very strong bulwark. I mean, in 2021, the world we're living in, um, grassroots advocacy is impactful these days. And, uh, we, already have very well established like small scale cultivators who care about the craft and dispensaries that care about you know sell, selling fire and like they will fight tooth and nail against like a corporate distributor coming in and tell them what they can and can't you know stock and and what they you know that they, they're they're going to like people don't like corporate anyway like they, they don't want that. They, they kind of, re, there's a cultural part of cannabis that is very suspicious of that type of structure. And there, there's going to be, a, there will be a, like a, a very strong grassroots effort. I think like that will, that would just try to tear that down uh, if that idea really started to gain momentum. But, but here's a, here's a partial list. Um, you know, Christian and I gave a presentation a couple months ago to the association that represents the regulators and beverage control states. So like Virginia, um, uh, Maryland, for instance. Um, and AB InBev has a joint venture. Constellation Brands has an investment in Canopy Growth. Uh, Heineken and Lagunitas have a craft uh, partnership called Canacraft. There's Molson Coors with Hexo. And then, you know, Brian actually shared in preparation for this meeting, he shared the Boston Beer R&D project that they're doing in Canada. Um, which I think was just announced yesterday. They, they dropped a press release yesterday or the day before. Um, can I, can I say when I when I saw that, like you know, the, all of those uh, Sam Adams version with like Jim Cox or or Coke or whatever, he's got like the hops and he's just like rubbing his face and smelling the hops. I just I'm waiting for the Sam Adams commercial where he's doing that with like a big bowl of, of bud and he just like smeared his face in the bud. <laughs> <laughs> Before they make cannabis beverages. Sorry, Chad. <laughs> well, well, and you know, and most of the products that we looked at in our presentation were, you know, just because of regulatory purposes. You know, we're talking about CBD 
beverages is what, what's being rolled out. Um, but that's going to change when the federal law catches up. Um, right now, you know, a number of states have moved to ban, including Oregon, I think is probably uh, one of the pioneers have, met, ban, have moved to explicitly ban um, THC, alcoholic beverages, right? But um, in TGB, it put out a circular in April of April or May of 2019, sort of effectively doing the same thing. Um, but, you know, it's eventually going to change. If, if we're living in a world 15 years from now, five years from now, where there's a federal uh, legalization and there's the Safe Baking Act, um, and then also interstate commerce is opened up because of that, you're, we're either going to already have alcoholic beverages with, with THC in it, or we're going to be pretty damn close to having it. So I, I don't know what the time frame is. You know, as we've seen, you know, we're, we're five months into a new administration. Um, if you go on Twitter, a lot of people are complaining that things aren't moving as fast as they would like. I don't know, Twitter complains that everything's not moving as fast as they would like. So I don't know if that's the real world or not. But eventually we're going to get there, whether it's five years from now or 25, you know, hopefully it's going to be in our lifetime. I think Can that's- Can I ask you guys a question about that? Because I'm, I'm genuinely, I don't know the answers. I'm genuinely interested. Okay, so so Tony, I mean, point point, it, your point is extremely well taken. So you have a, a lot of the big players in like a lot of the big alcohol brands have invested in cannabis or have joint ventures. Uh, they all they all deal with the three tier system now in alcohol. Are they fans of that system? Would they want that to penetrate their, this new opportunity to make money? Well, it seems like they would not want that. There's well, so it's an in, there's an interesting situation here, and this is actually <laughs> Tony mentioning. Boston beer touches on something that I find fascinating. Um, if anybody wants to run with this story idea, Kate, I'm looking in your direction. No um, more assignments. Uh, <laughs> and this happens every time we have a happy hour. <laughs> if, if because the the function one of those companies, Christian, that you're talking about, the change in the marketplace for what they had built their foundation on beer has shifted dramatically. In a lot of cases, with the exception of Constellation with beer, which is just, you know, their import portfolio is doing, you know, like a third of the lifting of the entire beer category right now, their portfolio specifically. Um, so, and that's, they're, all of these companies, their um, adventures in non-beer products, which now includes uh, you know, the potential for THC, which as we've seen most recently with Boston beer. And the reason I brought that up to you guys too, was because Canada to me right now is a proving ground for all these companies because they are just waiting for the green light because they're already there. Their engines are revving. They've been doing laps around and they just need that green light to finally just put it to the floor because the amount of R&D and investment, and Alexi, thank you for mentioning the link for Breakthrough in Canada too in the chat. All of the things that I see going on with these large companies um, investing and partnering just screams that they're just waiting for something to happen to come south of the border to finally once again gain additional relevancy in a way that they haven't maybe now in 10 years or so. So I don't know if that addresses specifically in terms of thinking about it for where that places all of this in the ecosystem of, dis of distributors, but so, so much that they are also the companies that have the strongest relationships with those distributors. And so if they are able to have those developed products that took place in Canada, where they've had investment and they have sales data and they have all of this that they can then bring down to the US. It's just like, I've got my like tinfoil hat on and I'm smoking my cigarette, like directing people at the board behind me. There's just like a lot going on here. Well, I've got a, I've got a spicy take and this might be another uh, minor tangent, but I think one of the challenges with true cannabis beverage, not the, not the CBD alcoholic beverages, a true THC plus alcoholic beverages uh, beverage is that I don't think the demand is going to be what we think it is. 
there's a there's a substantial chance that consumer demand isn't there that for that because people may not want to drink their cannabis with their alcohol for the same reason that people of course you know christian's points well taken uh, i think it was christian that said this that um you know people, people obviously drink and smoke at the same time but there's a lot of people who choose not to drink and smoke at the same time you know because of the reason that they they don't want to you know they don't want to spin out, right? <laughs> they don't want to have that experience. So it may be challenging. And also one of the things we talked about quite a bit with cannabis beverages, and it's something that's been an issue across multiple jurisdictions, especially in Canada, um, has been dosage. Dosage for THC and, and, and how that affects um, the taxation, how that affects the purchasing process. You know, some, some jurisdictions have limitations on product sizing, things of that nature. And when you add in sort of the alcohol regulatory structure and then the alcohol content, it just makes it very complicated. You know, people like to go out, you know, the, you know, one thing that's gotten more and more popular, and, and Brian knows probably more about this than I do, I, I can say certainly knows more about this than I do, sort of, yeah, you know, low calorie beers, session IPAs, things that are designed to be lighter, um, even though they still contain alcohol. Um, you know, as people continue to, to move towards that, even if they're not necessarily moving towards non-alcoholic, even though there's more and more products in that space, um, how does that dovetail with now adding another intoxicant to the product? So I think it's a complicated question. And I, I, I wonder if there is a cannabis and alcoholic beverage mix out today, say it came out tomorrow morning. I wonder how many people to rush for it. You know, people who do use alcohol and use cannabis I wonder how many people are rushed to try this new product when they can already access both, both of these ingredients now. You can have your favorite craft beer and then consume cannabis, THC products in whichever form that you like. And you can do it in a, in a dosage that makes sense, you know, whatever experience you're going for, going for from the THC side, um, whether it's light or heavy, and whatever experience you're going for as far as your, as far as your alcohol consumption issue. And of course, down here in Florida, it's hot all the time. So, you know, I, I can imagine a scenario where people don't aren't that excited on a, a 98 degree day in August with 100 percent humidity. They aren't that excited about consuming a ton of THC um, with a ton of alcohol um, while sitting at a Tampa Bay Rays game. Um, well, that's a bad example because they, they, their air conditioning works there, even if it's barely. But sitting, <laughs> tailgating, let's say, for University of Florida game, going to the Florida-Georgia game, that might be a problematic fix. And not in problematic from a health standpoint, but problematic as far as you wanting to sit in the stands until the second quarter, right? It might be a lifestyle situation. Well, I wonder then if, like, are we making a huge logical mistake in trying to equate beverage alcohol industry with the cannabis industry too much? I mean, like you alluded to, uh, Tony, it is like a quintessentially different experience being high and being drunk and you might do it for different reasons you might do one and not the other you might never cross because you don't want to you know lay down on your bed and be on a, uh, a carousel um so is this a a fallacy that like we're just so brain poisoned by thinking about alcohol prohibition is the only way we can understand marijuana prohibition well i think if we're making that mistake and we being the people on this call I think that means that probably everybody's making the mistake, right? <laughs> I mean, I think well, yeah, it's a- yeah, We is the biggest we possible, right? Right. I mean, I think it's a foregone conclusion that alcoholic beverage manufacturers are continuing to invest in this space. And I think it's going to be a lot easier for them when the interstate commerce problem um, is solved via federal, um, uh, federal legalization. Because right now to invest into any particular state, um, obviously every state has a different regulatory mechanism as far as how you get in. But, you know, generally speaking, if it's a state where licenses are transferable um, and you're allowed to buy your way in, it's a substantial investment. You know, we're talking about um, dozens of millions of dollars, if not over $100 million in terms of acquiring licenses at times, you know, varies by jurisdiction. And then you have the infrastructural pick, uh, pieces, especially if you're vertically integrated, the operational cost. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot of money for a national beer manufacturer or spirits manufacturer that wants to play in the cannabis space, just to get into one of the 50 states, it's a substantial investment. And then they're sort of on an island there, you know, escape from LA, sort of situation, escape from New York type of situation. Um, you know, from <laughs> an escape from New York, but, but a regulatory component. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're definitely headed down that road. The good thing though about the segmented licensing thing, you know, we talked a little bit about 
um, sort of that um, anti-corporate perspective in traditional cannabis culture. And obviously in the craft beer culture is a very intense part of the craft beer discussion, especially on craft beer Twitter. My God, um, God forbid a brewery get popular folks. I mean, come on, are we allowed to sell beer or not? I thought we were here to sell beer. Um, God forbid you sell one more beer than Twitter thinks you're allowed to sell or they'll turn on you. Um, you know, but one good thing from that perspective, if you are anti-corporate, anti the man, at least on the cannabis side, having these um, 50 different structures or however many states are legal now, 30 something states um, with recreational, at least it's given time for these local homegrown companies to get roots, even multi-state operators. Multi-state operators have different operations in each state that have their own personalities and own products. So if you're somebody who cares about that, who cares about having more of a local experience with local people that are running it and it's growing out of the ground in your community um, um, and, 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 and that matters to you, at least um, the local operators have had a head start in that perspective. Um, so for now, you know, if you're anti-man, anti-demand, at least uh, the cannabis space is uh, relatively friendly to that. Of course, you can quibble on, on how big is big, right? Because, you know, obviously a lot of multi-state operators and other operators aren't making good money in the cannabis space. There's one, one I would say there's one, um, one important issue that, that I think changes that calculation a little bit in the short term. And so Gerard, I think you're kind of speaking like a futurist. I think eventually these paths will begin to converge. The issue is that unlike alcohol, marijuana has different structures for recreational cannabis, but then we have an entire regulatory structure for medical cannabis. And you, it, it really affects your brand positioning, the way you regulate it, what you can say about your products. Just like you look at a market like California, where you can be very fun, very playful, very forward. And you look at a market like Florida, where it's very tight, very like, very, you, you can't do the same things that you can do in California. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is, this is one of the reasons I think why federal prohibition has continued. Um, obviously just because there's some regulatory inertia, there's political battles, but like, I, I legitimately think the regulatory agencies like the FDA um, or the Department of Agriculture, or I mean, basically anybody who's involved and in going to touch cannabis, I'm not sure they really know what they're going to do, like whether or not it's a nutraceutical, it's it's an intoxicant, just like alcohol, it's a medical product that needs to go through the FDA approval process and any health claims you ha make has to be, you know, double blind studied and, and has to be approved by this, this monolithic gov government agency that will like come for your family and, and all of your money if, if you're like defrauding patients. So it's like, it's, it's, uh, that the, the, the bifurcated structure of rec and medical, uh, is really a, a complication in cannabis, just kind of putting pedal to metal and metal and essentially becoming alcohol because you have this regulatory tail. Um, and we don't really know how much freedom states are going to have, like, whether or not you really are going to be able to strictly ban it, or if they're going to have to, like, if they take it off the scheduling, pro like if they take it off, uh, it's no longer scheduled, right? It's just like alcohol. It's just something that can consume. Um, it goes that way. But if, if they do something like the Moore Act, where they're just letting like states basically regulate however they want to regulate, you, you're going to, you, you may not get as much progress uh, if you have half of the country just like not letting these these companies become kind of what they ultimately could be. Um, I want to ask you guys, uh, I guess, as those who cover and think about this stuff, I think we, we've talked a little bit about the ways that um, we might be able to think about storytelling and covering these kinds of things. But I don't know if we've asked this explicitly quite yet in this conversation, Christian, Tony, is what are the things that, you know, we may be missing or just not seeing right now that are kind of like really front of mind that could turn into stories that we could and should 
think about? I'll, t- I'll tell you the first thing, because it's, it's to me the most interesting thing that's happening in Canada's public policy is um, what, what happened in New York, I think is happening in DC over the past three years, which was Republicans and conservatives were not the, the, were not the reason New York was not able to pass REC. And while it was such a slog this last year, it, there's a schism within the Democratic Party about like how that looks and how that's structured. And you're, you're going to see it, I think, in DC. I think those conversations are happening, but you've kind of got a Schumer and an AOC, right? And so you have like, you have a like pro legalization, let's get it done. And then you have the rise of, and I think it's a very important conversation, the social equity component. And like, that compli- that like the conversation for legalizing cannabis is way more complicated now uh, with the way we think about legalization than say like 2007, 16, 17, which is just like, okay, it's an off switch and it's an on switch. Now that we're thinking about social justice, we're thinking about people, you know, who were arrested and, and what to do with like, as far as expunging those crimes, what to do with the criminal criminal component, like, we still charge a misdemeanors here, like, can you still get a felony for growing a certain amount of plants when it's federally legal? Um, so, like, I'm watching very closely about the political, like, the political machinations that happen within the Democratic Party. And like, don't forget, <laughs> I don't think anybody knows what Joe Biden thinks about this because he's not talking about it. So like what Kamala Harris and Joe Biden like think like it, it I, I would I would love to hear just him say like if the, if, if the House and the Senate agree and they put something on his desk, like, are, are you going to sign it? Well, um, and I, I can <laughs> say this and I'll, I'll, I'll disclaim Christian from all of these comments, of course, the, I don't represent a multi-state operator in the cannabis space. The Democrats' approach to cannabis in 2020 was, frankly, the, one of the most baffling political things I've seen. Um, uh, non-insurrection. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it was a complete layup. There was still a chance to contrast against the Republican Party, because at that point, they were not ready to get there. And to Christian's point about sort of developing these different states, you can see they're moving there. They're getting there. You know, some of the most conservative members of the, the House of Representatives in D.C. Um, are also marijuana advocates now, right? Um, and the fact that they didn't hit this T-ball, you know, this ball off the tee, um, <laughs> T-ball. <laughs> and, and, and hit a home run on this oh issue God. and contrast. And, 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 and it also, the interesting <laughs> thing about cannabis, if you look at the polling numbers, is that it polls well on both sides. So it was a chance to have another issue to reach to moderates um, uh, and to moderate Republicans, and even the conservative Republicans that have had the, the, you know, that are really advocates for cannabis and have benefited, you know, because of their arthritis or their ailments, and they've had CBD, they go to the dispensary, they, they enjoy the service, they see that it's real. Um, even if they thought it was fake 15 years ago, they've had a chance to, to, to experience it. It was a chance to reach out to them on yet another issue, because not to get into specifics, you know, Joe Biden was trying to triangulate on a couple different things and, and trying to find those moderates, those people in the middle, and those independents, right? And the fact that they didn't take it is baffling to me. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, fact- the DCC didn't, I mean, they the DCC expressly didn't put it on their, on their platform for 2020. Like that, so that's the second story, right? So what what's happening now that the, the Democrats control the House, the Senate and the White House, right? really interesting to see what those internal conversations are like and and what the mechanics are. The second thing is this is so popular and like, and politicians ultimately, they, they want to do two things. They want to do, do right by their constituents and they want to continue to be elected, right? Their constituents, the, the like, not just majority, but in many of these states, the super majority are in favor of legalizing adult use cannabis. And the fact that that's not being widely adopted by, by the, the, the duly elected representatives of the, of the people, it, it, I don't understand it. It's either personal bias or maybe, maybe there is an underlying, like one thing I've suspected that I'm, I'm not sure is like whether there's a difference between like the public polls we see and then more in-depth private polls about what, okay, people are generally favored, but maybe they're not so strong. They strove, maybe the antis really, really care and the pros don't really care. So you don't actually benefit by appealing to the, the pros and you, you lose, you actually lose voters 
because they they hate it so much. But I I don't understand it. I follow this every day. This is my job. I don't understand the the both at the state and the federal level with how popular this is polling. It seems like I'm just thinking of for some reason I'm thinking about like Mayor Quimby from The Simpsons. Like Mayor Quimby would support Rec. Like all of these just kind of retail politicians, you'd think they would just pivot and like, okay, we're just going to add it to the platform. We're going to pick up a couple of voters. Um, and and there, what's crazy too is we, we saw in Florida, which are our only statewide um, Democrat that got elected, she ran on a pro, like that is the reason she won the primary and a big reason why she won the general was because she was the marijuana candidate. And, and so the story is proving itself out. This is popular and you can get elected um I, i'm just baffled by it i don't know where oh, there's a ahead. candidate who is like the marijuana candidate like in minnesota there's like a marijuana party and like that is like their single issue that they run the, for the governor on and yeah. it's like it i don't think it's strong so enough to be a one away from their base you know yeah i don't like, know um, if it's strong enough to be a one like a one issue party basically I th maybe maybe in some like local elections, but like right, statewide, that's, that's going to be tough. Um, but like when you've got the like the plethora of issues, maybe maybe the, maybe it's just like everybody's so in agreement, it just doesn't get them anything to go out on that on that limb. I don't know. I'm well, sorry, I, I interrupted. I, I, I want to bring back the, 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 the top state. You know, there's only one statewide elected Democrat um, who is the agricultural commission, right? Um, and of course, I'll, again, I'm disclaiming Christian from all these comments. Um, oh, please, please, please don't say anything that's going to get me in trouble. Oh, no, no, no. This isn't, <laughs> this, no, this isn't bad. This is just general observations about, you know, I'm not a very familiar with the agricultural commissioner's office. I used to work um, in house at an agricultural company, so I'm just familiar with that space. The agricultural commissioner race is very conservative. That is a Republican office. It's been a Republican office since I moved to Florida. Um, it just is. The Republicans control that office. If you look at the donor list in those races, you know, the farming community in Florida and agriculture is a top, uh, top three industry in the state of Florida. It's little known, but it's a very substantial industry down here because uh, we have so much land. Um, it's it, the, the people, sort of the, the gray beards in that industry are very conservative. And the fact that a Democrat, um, and I believe she's from South Florida, right, Christian? She was the, the a, a, a South Florida a female Democrat walked into a statewide race for agricultural commissioner and took it when one of her main issues was cannabis shows how strong that subject is. This is not the race that Democrats win. It just is not. Attorney General, yeah, I mean, not recently, but yeah, that's something they've run more, one more recently. The gubernatorial, well, I guess they don't win anything. I guess that's the point. <laughs> now that I think about it, they haven't won anything. But she did. Yeah, except for her in, in, in what's considered to be the most challenging race. And, in, you know, I'm looking at an article of Teen Vogue they wrote in January 7, 2021. And the headline is, I'm connecting this back to, you know, why didn't Democrats take advantage of this issue? Um, which, in, by the way, 2020 might have been the last chance to take advantage of this cannabis issue, by the way, because like we mentioned, conservatives and Republicans are moving right into the more mainstream position on cannabis. Democratic leaders in Congress are old and out of touch. That's the headline of this article. When you go through and look, you know, um, Nancy Pelosi is 80, I believe. Um, Steny Hoyer, I believe, is 78. I believe that I believe that Joe Biden is in the 70s as well. You know, um, excuse me, Joe Biden is 70. Chuck Schumer is seven. Uh, Joe Biden is 78. Chuck Schumer is 70. Pelosi is 80. Um, I, I, I just wonder what component that played in it, right? They may not be as comfortable with it as someone who's in their 40s or someone who's in their 60s. Maybe this is something where, you know, three years from now, it looks completely different. But the, you know, like I said, three years from now, everybody's going to be, here. you know, <laughs> everybody's going to be ready. But 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about why, why aren't, why isn't this party uh, being more aggressive about psychedelics or whatever the next, next issue is, right? Um, that's the nature of this business. We're going to move on to the next issue as we continue making progress on any one. Uh, 
I was going to ask about psychedelics, but for sake of time, I actually have like a list of things. This has been wonderful. Uh, I don't even know if I got like half the things I wanted to talk about. And, and I think this is like an incredibly productive conversation. Um, I personally have to run. Um, so I, cause I can do this cause we've got enough people by show of hands. Is it okay? Can I, if you if you want to stick around, uh, please do, but I was going to end the recording and step away. But if, if any of you guys want to stick around and keep talking by all means.